Uh, thank you for coming to this intercropping um, meeting. Um, for those who haven't met me, I'm Jerry Olford. I'm farming advisor at the Soil Association. Um, one of the projects the Soil Association is involved with is Innovative Farmers. Innovative Farmers supports farmer led research um, from the ground up. So it's projects that people want to be involved with. Occasionally within these projects, we actually work in conjunction with bigger projects such as, in this case, the Diversify project, which looked at intercropping, funded by a European project. If anyone is inspired by what gets said during this meeting, we are about to start a new project, um, an innovative farmers project on intercropping with Reading University um, called Leguminose. And if you're interested in being involved in part of that, we're going to be looking at the biodiversity effects, um, crop, soil effects, yield effects, and a wide range of other topics that we haven't totally cleared up yet. Um, so if you want to be involved on a field scales, it would be great to, to let us know um, and we can sort of move forward on that one. We've got a great lineup of experienced intercropping farmers here. We know intercropping has major positive benefits, but what we feel is important is that the knowledge that they have gained by doing it themselves is disseminated to the general population of farmers so that they don't feel they're trying it themselves and it's going to go, if it goes wrong, it's a disaster. These have tried things, it's worked, and it hasn't worked. And the idea of this workshop is they would explain to you. And then once they've explained what they do on their farm, they're going to open up for questions. We have a roving, roving mic. So if you could please speak into the mic to ask the questions because this session is being recorded. And um, hopefully we can all learn an awful lot from each other during the course of this session. So the three speakers, um, I'll just introduce them quickly as to who they are, but they're going to introduce themselves, their farming system, etc. moving forward. So if Andy Howard, um, a lot of people may know Andy Howard because of his um, Nuffield scholarship on this project. Um, so he is somewhat of an expert, so it's great we got him on here. Doug Christie, who farms organically and conventionally in Scotland, um, demonstrating that intercropping is uh, a serious consideration in the northern part of the country. A lot of the work gets done here in the south, but it's something that's important for the rest of the, the whole of the UK. And also James Hares, who farms organically on heavy clay and one of the farmers that's involved in the Innovative Farmers trial. Um, we'll talk about some of his experience and some of the things he's learned from that himself and how he's taking it forward. So I'll stop talking, hand over to the people that we really want to talk to. So Andy, please. Morning. OK, it's working. It's good. Sorry, the light's a bit bright. It's, um, I'm trying to look somewhere else. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm Andy Howard, a conventional farmer from Kent, conventional-ish farmer, not organic. Um, family farm, just my dad and I, 300 hectares. And I guess we did our first intercrop in 2013, 2014, I think. Just a small field of peas and all-seed rape. Um, and since then, we've done various things. Um, I, s I suppose i start with this year. I've got lentils and camelina together. I've got linseed and oats together. And I've got spring beans and spring all-seed rape together this year. Um, but we do do spring beans and spring oats quite a lot. Um, peas and oats we have done. I'm trying to think of all the other ones I've done. I've tried quite a few and not done very well on some of them. Um, <clears throat> but it's it's something that we find fits very well um, for our system. You need a lot less fertilizer or no fertilizer, a lot less chemistry. They're very cheap to grow. Um, but we do have our own separator at home. We've built our own separator, so we do have that. We can separate our at home ourselves, which makes it a bit cheaper for us, um, which is one of the issues that always comes up, and probably a question that comes up is like, how do I separate it? Well, we did it, we bought our, uh, built our own, <clears throat> but you do have to be careful when you're putting things together. I mean, we've done certain things that don't separate. I mean, we grow lentils for hobmadods, and I had an idea from Canada to put lentils and um, linseed together because that's what they did in Canada, but. Homer Dodds has still got a bag of lentils and linseed in their store in Norfolk because they can't get it separated. So um, <coughs> there you go. But that's, that's those are the kind of things you've got to think about. Um, but um, I guess we'll get onto those technicalities as we go on. But um, that's my history of intercropping, about 10 years now, I suppose, and still learning a lot. There's, there's, I haven't met anyone who's an expert because we, there's a lot to learn. Um, and it's different for everyone as well. Doug. Um, Good morning, everyone. Doug Christie. Doug Christie. I farm um, in Fife in Scotland, and um, for the last 30, 30 or so, 30 or so years, um, 
for the last 20 years, since 2000, I've gone down the direct drilling route um, to begin with. Um, well, I haven't plowed a lot of my fields since then, but two thirds of the farm is conventional arable arable stockless rotation and a third of the farm is organic mainly livestock based um, with some organic crops in that as well um, I was in, I got interested into cropping after um, um, listening to Frederick Thomas from France and um, a couple of strip trips to the States which really spurred off sp spurred up my interest in um, trying growing two or three crops um, at the same time and for the last five or six years, or even more, I've been um, tinkering with, I'm by no means um, an expert at all in cover cro in companion cropping, but um, in some cases, in, mo in a lot of cases, it's not worked at all. So um, I've started off by growing, I think it's the same as Andy, um, I think it, but I think it was peas and barley to begin with for a couple of years. And um, beans and oats have been, good one that's been quite successful and I've grown them for five years at various seed rates um, what else have I done um, um, oh, rye and peas um, also I've tried three-way three-way mixes um, for three years of spring peas spring all seed rate and spring oats and I'm quite staggered after two years of um, on the conventional system after two years of, of, of cereal crops wheat and then barley the on light, the light soils I'm on, uh, there certainly won't be much residual nitrogen in that ground. Um, but with the break crops, I've usually used uh, companion crops in the break crop situation of the rotation and quite staggered about the health and the, um, the vitality of the cereal elements and the brassica elements if there is legumes in, in the mix. Um, it certainly would, and this was this is only with a maximum of twenty to forty kilo, kilograms of nitrogen applied, synthetic nitrogen applied, and in a lot of cases not applied at all. Um, very healthy crop, but yields were they were reasonable, but it is a real hassle. So it can be a real hassle, hassle separating separating the crops. And as Andy said, I'm very I'm very lucky. I've got I I bought a. Um, 20 years ago, a, um, a second-hand um, Lord Denny rotary cleaner, which does a lot of the um, separating. But originally, I bought it for doing my own seed um, without, with, without dressing. And um, I had to hand a, a, a wadge of um, a brand envelope of cash to a scrap dealer who turned up in a Mercedes with blacked-out windows one year, 20 years ago. Anyway, I'm very happy that he, he, um, he took the money. So um, the... The, the, what else have I grown? Um, beans, spring oats, and vetch. And the vetch was a mistake because it was left over with a cover crop, and the, the pigeons nailed it to the ground. Um, so it was, it, it was, um, and it reemerged within the spring beans and spring oats crop. But, but I was quite amazed at that, and. The, Luckily, I managed to separate them out, so I had some uh, quite a bit of vetch to um, vetch to for seed for the following years, um, and spring all seed rape and vetch, which was it didn't it didn't do too very uh, didn't go very well. But the, the going back to the spring beans and spring barley that I did for a couple of years, I was a bit worried that the spring barley might, um, with the with the nitrogen maybe really being released by the peas later on, the the malting, um, the nitrogen levels of the spring barley uh, would be too high because I grow for spring barley for distilling, and um, that needs a, a maximum of up to 1.7% um, nitrogen, and the the nitrogen from that companion crop spring barley was 1.55, which was about average from a monocropped um, spring barley crop. And that was without, without any nitrogen, because I've got more, I've probably got more questions than answers on the companion cropping side, but um, um, it's, I think there is a future for it. Um, from all the research done by the research establishments like um, the James Hutton and um, Reading, Reading do, a lot of companion crops, um, the land equivalent ratio of growing companion crops theoretically should be higher than growing a monocrop. 
And um, with the prices of I'm the prices of fertilizer this now, I really want to see if I can. It's, it gives a platform to be drastically reduce the amount of fertilizer and synthetic nitrogen used in crops, um, and growing brassicas and the wheat element is could be very interesting and. I don't know whether there's a possibility down the road of actually trying a field of growing continuous companion crops for, for, for some years. Um, you've got to be quite careful about what crops you grow in succeeding years. But I don't know, is there an issue of growing beans five years in a row if it's in a companion crop situation? Um, I think there possibly could be, but um, I don't know if anyone's tried it. Um, but I will pass you across to, and also this year I'm growing, um, I'm part of a Seams project, look up in, on the internet, um, Ali Carley and Rob Brooker from the James Hudson Institute, Institute are doing this, um, this research amongst, on a field-based tr trials around farms in Scotland and um, also at the, the Research Institute themselves. Um, and there's a lot of good information from the Seams project and the Diversify project in the past on intercropping um, if you if you want to find out any any more, but I'll pass you across to James. Okay. Um, yes, I'm James Hares. I farm uh, 130 hectares of organic mixed land. Um, not well, the land's not mixed. That's heavy clay, but a mixed farm yeah, near Swindon. And yeah, we've been doing intercropping for about three four years. I can't remember the exact date we did it. Sorry, I have young children. My memory is gone now. Uh, <laughs> In fact, one woke me up at 2 a.m. Anyway, um, yeah, so we originally started out trying into cropping as really a reaction to an incredibly poor bean crop. We essentially had a crop failure on two-thirds of the field that we had in beans and thought there had to be something we could do about it. So we decided to kind of throw the bag of Malika wheat that we had tucked at the back of the shed into the ground and see what happens. And as it turns out, it was a really good idea. Um, essentially, we ended up with a 62% um, reduction in weed biomass in our crop and some wheat at the end of it. So that kind of led us to get involved with the Innovative Farmer trial. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess there's just a few kind of things I want to mention, like um, flowering. We noticed along the lines of like crop health and vitality, uh, the flowering date was about two days earlier on our intercrop than our monoculture of beans. Um, there was a protein lift in the wheat that was accompanying the beans as well. So there's definitely, I don't really think I saw a lot of yield difference, but yeah, the, the protein certainly was lifted. Um, I don't really know what more else you want me to say, but... Okay, so... Um That's one of the interesting aspects on intercropping, is the ability to one crop will maybe fail, but the other crop will continue going. And I know the research says it's 1.3, 1.4 land rate area ratio. But have you guys actually seen that happen, do you feel, in the ground? Or do you think you've got the higher yield in the multi-crops, in the intercrops? Uh, I see a lot of our intercrops are spring crops, and spring cropping is notoriously... Uh, hit and miss. So what I have seen, it, it evens out the yield. You have certain parts of the field, you've put, say, I've done beans and all seed rape, spring all seed rape. I mean, you can have a complete failure of spring all seed rape, but if you've got the two together, you'll see that across the field, different soil types, different pest pressures, you'll you'll get an even yield. Um, it depends on the intercrop and depends on the year, but we normally... The trials we did with innovative farmers, I think, I know with um, PGRO, the first year of wheat and beans, our gross margin was £250 a hectare higher compared to monocrop beans and monocrop oats. So we've definitely seen it. But it, the following year, it was only about £40 a hectare. But we've I've never seen a loss on the wheat and uh, the beans and the oats, um, less than the, 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 less than the uh, monocrop. Um, yeah, um, in terms of yields of like Andy said spread across the field the t yields and the yield of each tends to vary quite a lot based on the sections of the field but where there might be a failure in our beans the wheat does tend to make up for it and yeah definitely definitely profitable okay 
I'm going to open up to questions from the floor. If anyone has any, you put your hand up and we have a roving mic. Um, I'll try and catch you in order that you put your hand up. Um, if you'll ask it to anyone specifically or generally, but I'll also let the, any on the panel answer the question as well. So the first one was here. And there's another one at the back. Which one? Sorry, excuse me. Thank you. Thanks for your explanation. Uh, how do you determine when to harvest based on which crop? And, and is that for highest value or? Harvest. You, you've got to plan what you're going to plant to start with. There's no point in having... I mean, the, the harvest dates do merge. So we saw that last year in our beans and oats. I had a, We had a strip of just oats next to our beans and oats because we were doing a trial with PGRO and the oats by themselves were four or five days ahead. They were going off yellow and the, the, the oats in the beans next door were completely still green. So they, the, the harvest dates will merge. Um, but I, I, you don't... You, you have to harvest it when they're both ready, don't you, really? Um, but you've got to be careful not to have two crops that are too different. I mean, the first cr first crops I grew were were peas and spring or seed rape. And the one problem I did have was that we were having to wait for the spring or seed rape. And with peas, you get paid on colour. And if you get a wet week, you can't necessarily... So that's why we kind of stopped with the peas and all seed rape. Um, <clears throat> so you just have to manage it, really. But it does does merge and it does does um it does come together to a certain extent. Yeah. Um. So we had a similar experience to Andy that they do. There is a window where they do meet. That window isn't necessarily very big. So if the weather closes on you, that can become a bit of a problem. But most of the time, we're waiting around for our beans. Really, well and truly, we're waiting waiting for the beans, and the wheat is usually sitting there, and we're hoping that not too much falls out in the meantime. But um, our, our end use is, I should have said, is generally for feeding our cattle. So we're more after the beans than the wheat. So the wheat is really more of a bonus for us. Yeah, I've had um, interesting times with different um, ripening. But as Andy said, they, um, they, do, they, do, they do tend to merge. And um, of five years of growing bean, beans and oats, um, only Beans are in Scotland are a lot later than spring oats um, are maturing, um, but in five years of growing them, only once have I lost a reasonable amount of oats through wind. Um, it was very dry just prior to harvest, and um, a lot of the oats, not all, I think, ten percent landed on the deck. Um, I can't I counted them. I put a square out and counted the amount of oats per square meter, and ten percent landed on the floor. But um, I'm quite relaxed if that happens in a way because that's half my cover crop zone for the for the winter. So there's I'm, I'm quite taking quite a relaxed attitude of, and um, chain you, and um, open to open to. Um, there's always downsides, but sometimes those downsides can have have a bit of a silver lining to them. Um, also, um, linseed, last year, uh, I'm going back to the land equivalent ratio, um, last year I grew um, spring, spring linseed and spring oats, and um, I had to take a lot of the field out, um, a lot of the oats out of the linseed um, for, um, because there was wild oats in there and there was too many wild oats, I had to, I had to spray that out with a, gr a griminicide. And funny enough, the, uh, the, the yield of the oats, oats Oats and the linseed remaining in the field was um, quite a bit higher than the the area where I'd taken the oats out. Um, and also, you know, there's, a, there's so many possibilities with companion cropping. And, and for two years, two years, uh, for two or three years, I grew um, ju um, turnip grape with my wheat, and I put it in with my wheat um, in the autumn, my winter wheat in with the autumn, because I was just thinking that. The roots, the roots, the tap roots of the of the of the of the turnip rape would help um, help with the rooting of the wheat over the winter, I mean, especially if we've got wet winters. And and I can't categorically say that it helped, but I did notice visually, and, and a lot of a lot of the farming I do is by observation that the wheat roots were stronger on those areas where the where the turnip rape was, and it also that leads on therefore to um, in the spring. If you've got sheep um, or 
light-footed livestock, um, then that opens up an opportunity for grazing that um, wheat crop. And if it's got some turnip rape in there, so much the better. The feed, va feed value will be so much better. So um, constantly looking at constantly, I'm constantly looking at um, um, advantages of 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 the of of growing two or three or four species at the same time. And, and obviously, in an organic situation, I've been growing um, I've been growing establishing lays. Um, um, under sowing spring barley or spring oats with um, with lays for quite a few years and and all intercropping is not new a mashlam was a quite a was a, was was beans and oats grown in Scotland and they there was quite considerable areas of this crop grown last century and the century before because um, it was a risk a risk aversion scheme um, if one crop failed they'd always have another crop and um, and that's and that's one way of looking at the resilience of um, growing companion crops um, in the future. Yeah. yeah, dredged corn, which is oats and barley, which we used to grow down in Devon, where I come from, um, was mentioned in Hansard at one point. So we had a question at the back, and then it was Lydia. So run. I want to also add to that question. You don't have to harvest both of them. We do in we do companion cropping as well, which is. You just ha harvest one of them, like like Doug was just talking about. So I've done linseed and oats before, but um, why we take out the we take out the oats because um, they they're good for deterring pests, the flea beetle. But once they're done, they're quite competitive, so we take them out. Um, but you, yeah, you don't have to buy a separator to start. You can just do companion cropping. Yeah, just a question on seed rates. I've done by cropping by default for many years and it works well where I've got um, be I'm organic but where I've got beans left over from um, the previous crop and then I sow a winter wheat so effectively I have a winter wheat and last year's spring beans that are for free because they just landed on the floor and, and I get them separated out but my question to you is if I did it intentionally what's your recommendation for seed rates um, you know if you're putting on 200 kilos say what would you do for the if you're doing oats and uh, beans or wheat and beans, what would you recommend on seed rates for the two? For, for me, the you, first question you go ask is what's, what are you trying to achieve? Um, and what's, what's your soil type? Sorry? As much money as possible. <laughs> yeah. In ter well, uh, James said he's what for, he wants the, b the beans with his wheat. So, you know, he's probably going to put his bean seed rate higher than someone who would want... Um, the oats but what i've found in the trials we've done with pgiro is if you're doing a, something like oats and beans together you need so little oats you wouldn't believe, only 70 plants per square meter which i think drilling was 11 kilos or something crazy um and that still yielded three four ton of oats um they're so competitive when i don't change my bean seed rate very much i might drop it from 40 per square meter down, uh, 50 down to 40 um, but I'm really going for the beans and having the oats as a weed suppress and and, um, and um, for disease as well. So I do think people sometimes put far too much cereals in, and then you just have a stalk of one or two one or two beans with a few pods on, and think, oh, that's all right. But if you if you put too many cereals in with your legumes, they'll they, I think they'll overpower it. I don't know whether you're the same. Um, uh, not exactly. Oh, I guess it depends partly on your soil type. Um, as to your seed rate. But um, for us, we drilled, I think it was last time we did it, it was 200 kilos of beans and then 100 of wheat, but we're still playing around with the seed rate. I think seed rate is something which not not loads is known about. I mean, we've all tried various seed rates, I'm sure, but we're still, exper still experimenting. Yeah, I've experimented quite a bit on seed rates, and um, just to take an example for my spring wheat and uh, spring beans this year. I've um, I've done two different um, seed rates. I one one was a high seed rate of the spring wheat, or nearly the full rate of spring wheat, and a very low rate of maybe um, 20, 20, 20, 20 plants per square meter of um, seeds per square meter of beans, and um, and then another plot further along, I've done the opposite. I've, it's full rate beans and a low rate of wheat. But funny enough, um, and I've not put any nitrogen on these plots at all. But funny enough, now I can the, the low bean rate plot 
with the high wheat spring wheat plot, it really stands out like a sore thumb. It is it it's yellow it's virtually yellow compared to the dark green of the other crop. But you've got everything's got to be in context. This is third this is this is um this third place in the rotation as a break crop after two cereal crops. But and I, I I concur with Andy on the um on the cereal element in a legume companion crop. Oats are incredibly competitive, and I've come down. I'm basically the, probably pretty much the same seed rates as him because I'm really wanting beans as the main crop, and um, so I'm growing a sort of beans at 55 seeds per square meter, and um, spring wheat, and uh, no, and spring oats at um, um, sowing sowing that at, um, maybe um, what is it? It was um, I think it was 60 kilos a hectare. I can't remember what the, that works out as a seed rate but it's half the it's well it's well under half the um the full seed rate for 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 spring oats but there again i, I have some years i've grown four rates of both crops um and then i've had a situation where um wild oats or brome come into the spring wheat or the cereal element and um, i've got to take them out and at least i'm left with a full rate of beans at the end and um, maybe I'm not a very good farmer, and I've got all these weeds, but it does give a bit of flex, more, a bit more flexibility um, if that happens. And also, in another year, the opposite happened. I got a lot of cleavers in my legume crop, so I took the beans out, um, the beans out, and was left with a reasonable, a re at least I was left with a reasonable crop of um, of, of spring oats then. Um, and also, I, with cover, using cover crops over the winter, I've been through the the heartache and the headache of um, having cereal element in the cover crop, growing a cereal afterwards or as a companion crop, in a companion crop, and um, BYDV came in with a vengeance and took, basically wiped out the um, cereal element in the cover crop, in, in the companion crop. Hi, so you're, you're all talking species and um some of you will have walked through the Naya plots here and seen some of our mixed or blended varieties for a given species. So my question is, it's begging to say, have any of you tried mixed varieties, particularly within your main crop, like your beans, where there might be a bit of pest or disease pressure? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what was that question again? No, basically, basically um, rather than just into into species cropping, in, well, basically mixed blend species, um, but it, not just within the wheat, because I suppose Wakeland's population is a classic example of the blended variety. But have you ever done blended varieties of not just of the wheat, but of actually of the other crops within the system? I'll, I'll expand a little bit on my no. I know it's a little bit flippant. Um, no, we haven't tried it, but for us being that we're after the beans for feed, we'd be more than open to trying some kind of a bean blend. And as far as wheat blend is concerned, we store ours we're with cam grain. So it depends on whether Tom Wood is happy with us doing that. <laughs> I, I haven't done, um, done that too much, and especially on the cereal element, because oats go to, um, most of my oats go to Quaker um, and they just want specific varieties, and I think they only want one or two varieties, oats that are suitable. And the same with the malting, for malting barley, um, they're very, the, the malts are very fussy. They just, even though there is a lot of evidence out there suggests that blends can be more resilient than, than, um, than single varieties, um, they're not really up to going down the, the blended route for malting for malting barley, so my hands are slightly slightly tied there, and I've I've certainly tried wheat wheat feed feed wheat blending um, feed wheats, but I I don't know that the gen genetic base of a lot of the majority of the wheat varieties is now is um is is all comes down to very few varieties in the fifties I think, but I know there's a lot of people growing heritage varieties now, which and which is quite exciting. And, yeah. um, I think there was a master blends thing about forty years ago when I was young that was mixed varieties, which didn't last very long, I think, for commercial pressures from the supply chain. So yeah, no, we grow wheat blends. Um, again, I haven't done it a huge amount, just for the exact same reason that you just have to put what you put on the passport. Um, but uh, for me, 
in Kent, our biggest disease is rusts in wheats, and the most popular wheat variety for the mill is Crusoe, um, which is terrible for brown rust. So we are, we are starting to play with it, trying to trying to reduce our. Now I'm trying to not use any fungicides at all, but with R Crusoe in Kent, it's almost almost impossible, no matter what you do. Um, so we are. That's why we are doing more blends, uh, Group One blends. But again, there isn't many Group Ones. Um, it's a lot easier for feed. Uh, our linseed, I think, is a blend. I don't know what's in it, um, but it is a blend. Uh, it makes sense to me, um, but you do have to be careful on your end market. And um, is there a follow up? Is there a follow up, then, Lydia. Uh, stress that. Um, I wasn't saying do one or the other, look at variety blends no. and species blends. So uh, <coughs> within your fabulous uh, ideas that you've been putting forward today to have some blends within your species, within the, um, within yep. the mixed cropping. I do find it quite ironic in some ways that we talk about diversity within the regen sort of concept, and then we're all trying to grow monocultures within that regen. So yeah. actually, um, I take your point, absolutely. Yeah. Um, question back there, and then one over there. Then Tim. Yeah, thanks, guys. I just had a brief question on your establishment methods and whether you've had any uh, different ideas regarding whether you're into row cropping or um, all mixed in the same tank and drilled at the same date. Um, whether you had any ideas on that? Um, yeah, um, I I established mine with beans first. We've got a weaving time drill, so we're on we're on wide row spacing because our other monoculture crops, we've got a garf and hoe which we run through them. So we've basically drilled at an angle to each other, and we drilled the wheat like a day or two after because the cultivation from the time drill kind of we don't mind a little bit of a knobbly bed for beans, and then that's generally worked down and been fine for the wheat, and that's that's been our approach. It seems to work quite well. Uh, um, we've in 2018. I got a leader grant for a for a cross slot drill, for exactly the reason it's got three hoppers on it, um, and you can plant things at different depths as well at the same time. So it just it depends on what in terms of drill. It depends on what you're drilling. So this year, my linseed and oats, just put them all together in the hopper. Um, but obviously, spring beans and spring oilseed rape, you can't put them in the same same depth. So they were an inch and a half different, but I planted in one go. When we, when we started, I was drilling the field twice, but I wasn't doing a very big area. But, you know, that's that's okay for a certain amount of time. Um, so it just depends on what you're doing. And I don't, as long as there's not too much difference between um, the desired depth for each one, I don't, I don't think beans need to be three inches, and I don't think sort of oats need to be. Beans and oats you can put together, that's fine, that'll work fine. Um, and in terms of you're talking about the alternate rows and everything, <coughs> doing my Nuffield scholarship and the work since, I th still haven't found anyone who can prove to the, me that alternate rows is any better. Um, it looks fancy on Twitter. Um, <laughs> but for me, if you're, if you're mixing a crop in a field, because you want the mixing effect underground and above ground, why do you then try and separate them in, in rows? I think you want as much interaction between the two. Um, so we with not, with PGRO we did do sort of strips and we just didn't see any difference to be honest. But what I did do this this year was to I cut off or last year sorry I did shut off some rows of oats, so I had two ro a row of beans by itself and a row of beans and oats and a row of beans by itself just to get the competitiveness of the oats down so they, were, they didn't drag the bean yield so much. So you still had the benefit of having the oats in the field, but you did have a row of just beans. Um, that seemed to work quite well. Um, yeah, I've, I've got a John Dale drill, a, a direct drill, and, it, and I can also, I can, I've only got two hoppers on mine, not as big as, not as good as Andy's, but um, um, the... Um, but I, and, I, and I can set the depths differently as well. But what I've also done, growing a three-way mix, is and I work, it's worked quite well in the past, is um, broadcasting the oats on or broadcasting the crop on prior to going on with the other, the other two species. And um, it's good in a way because actually the, with the, the tine action of the, of the drill, it actually push, pushes the, the oats to 
um, in, pretty much in between the rows, to, um, into between the rows of beans. So you've got a row of beans, and then you've got the oats of a few random oats in between, and then you've got the other um, row of row of row of row of beans. And that's 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 worked really well. But um, obviously, if you're in very dry conditions, you just wonder how effective the. Um, I don't think you'd be able to do that so well with a disc drill, but um, a low disturbance lit disc drill. But certainly with a tine drill, it does provide a little bit of soil movement to be able to cover these oats. But in a very dry year, um, you, I just wonder how many of these oats will come away. I don't think you need a fancy drill to start intercropping. You can just well, be, be inventive. The scale. <laughs> yeah, you just I'm be using it's weaving and you're using a cross slot. Yeah. It's completely opposite ends of the scale. So, so it's, it's just uh, one thing I always amazed about farmers and going around the world, you, everyone's very inventive. There's normally something in the back of the shed that you haven't used for 30 years, like your cleaner, and it gets stuck onto the, stuck onto something and a bit of weld and off you go. So yeah, I don't think you have to spend can lots I, of time. Can I just add one more thing? Um, I guess it partly depends on why you're doing the intercropping as well. So for us, it was about controlling the weeds. So we wouldn't want to have it in nice, neat rows. We want that kind of competitiveness of our wheat to try to drown out the weeds. So why you're doing it also factors into your decision in terms of how you're establishing. Okay. No. Uh, thank you. Do any of the speakers have any views or experiences on um, allelopathic uh, effects in their intercropping, either within crop or indeed on following crops? I think that would be the answer. James's point would be the weed control of the oats, um, or in fact, the allelopathic effect of, of the crop that you're growing within the mixture. Yeah. I don't know if the um, picture's been going around of the... There's two um, examples of a wild oat, one significantly smaller than the other one. Um, that was what happened between our monoculture beans and our intercrop. So you, you definitely get, in, you definitely get the, something. The, the two plants there, the, there was a very much smaller wild oat plant, which was on the um, intercropped piece, and a big... More bold, bold one, which was on the monoculture piece. Very so dark green. <laughs> very dark green. So yeah, but I don't know whether you would you use an intercropping because of the weed control. Uh, uh, as a, a conventional farmer with some still access to some herbicides, you, intercropping will uh, you, people it will reduce your weed biomass, but it doesn't necessarily reduce your number of weeds. No. 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 So you've got to. Intercropping will help with weeds, but it's not a silver bullet. It's not a replacement for a herbicide or a cultivation. So you've got to be careful where you put your intercrops as well. I mean, one of the reasons I I'm growing beans and all seed rape together this year instead of beans and oats is because the block of land had a few brome patches. So I wanted to be able to control the brome. So I switched to switch to all seed rape. It's it, it will help swamp weeds, but it doesn't. You know, if you've got bad black grass field and you think you're going to put um, just do an intercrop and it'll solve your black grass problem, <laughs> then it, it, it won't. So just just be careful. But there is, there is a weed effect, and alle alle I'm not sure it's alleopathy with oats in the crop. It's more competitiveness. But certainly, like Doug said, with cover crops, we've seen um, cereals in cover crops before. Spring cereals have a dramatic effect. Um, that's why we don't grow them anymore. Um, so, but yeah, but not. I don't think in the crop. I think it's more competitiveness, not not the alleopathy. Yeah, exactly that. The, I've I haven't really seen much in the way of allelopathic, but um, except when I've got a, a companion crop of brome and spring barley, and uh, when I take the, or brome and wheat, when I take the brome out, um, the wheat actually dies, and it must be something released in the root, the 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 roots there, and it's quite staggering, and that's what. I think you possibly got to be aware, and not that I've had experience in it. I think possibly looking forward, you got to be careful about what cro crops you grow with your companion crop. If you're using a companion crop as a, with a sacrificial companion crop, so you're taking one out. So, for example, if you're using, I know rye's got some quite high um, allelopathic quali qualities. So if you're growing rye and maybe maybe grazing the rye over the winter winter rye and, and you've got your main crop within the rye crop i think you possibly got to be queer and i'm just clutching at straws here you might you possibly got to be aware of taking that rye out in the spring with a chemical because it might um it might have an effect on the your main cash crop that you're trying to grow but i'm just um speculating that no, he's not here. 
Okay, there's one question there. With, um, yeah, along your row there. <coughs> Any further questions while we're waiting? Th thank you, David Emmett. Um, a few years ago, we grew beans in an old seed rape crop um, with the other sort of uh, bursting clover as well. Uh, unfortunately, never repeated it because it was a bit of a pain with John Deirdre who had two, two drilling drops. But um, A, we were told that the winter would kill off the spring beans, but it didn't. But they weren't tremendously thick, but the notice you could see where they were in the crop and you could also see where they were in the following crop. Unfortunately, we had no way of doing a yield assessment. I think it was something worth trying again, but it was the notification in that crop and the following crop was quite visible. Yeah, I, th I think that's the attraction of having legumes and in the crop because of the added, the free fertility that they're providing or fertilizer they're providing. And I know certainly there's been evidence, I think a quarter percent uplift in the protein content of wheat with an intercrop, which lifted a marginal a milling wheat up to a milling wheat standard. But again, it's not been proven strongly enough. Good research for a project for someone to do one of these nice researchers in the room. Any other comments on that? Or the question at the back. Hi. How do you find it's affecting your rotation? Because obviously when you're growing two crops together, traditionally we would have, say, two cereals and then a break crop and then two cereals and a different break crop, but you're kind of using them all together. So how is it affecting your rotation? And secondly, has anybody tried any freeway uh, mixes? Andy. I'll leave that one to you. Rotation, that question always comes up, and there's no scientific exact answer, but my answer always is I think the more diverse your rotation, the more diverse your intercrop, I think the more diverse you get your farm and your soil biology, rotations and breaks start to go out the window. Um, so in example, I think you kind of hinted at the start, if you had a three, four-way intercrop and you did that every year, you'd never see foot rot in your beans or anything because it's it's the it's it's diverse i mean you never see foot rot in vetches in the bottom of hedges and they're there every year um but it it doesn't necessarily affect our rotation but we're not doing necessarily we're probably doing 30 percent, 20 30 percent of the farm so we're, we're still growing wheat by itself and everything um and what was the other the three-way intercrops uh i tried this year but the flea beetle had one of them um, but we are looking at, there's a guy in Northumberland who's designed a separator that he reckons can separate four or five different things. So in the, f in the future, we're looking to possibly go, if we can get sort of four or five in intercrops, I think we suddenly, um, life will become a lot easier and a lot cheaper. Um, but I haven't used that separator yet, so the um, proof is yet in the pudding. But that is our next plan in the next few years is to really have sort of a winter mi winter mix of four or five different crops together and a, a spring mix and hopefully keep expanding that um, but that's yet to be done uh, being organic um, yes it definitely does impact our rotation a little bit because rotation is one of the tools we use to control our black grass um, <laughs> I mean my, my dad went organic as a result of herbicide resistant black grass anyway so even if we did have access to the chemicals we probably couldn't do anything about it uh, our rotation to, where for, before intercropping was wheat, typically then barley or beans, depending on how weedy the field was, followed by um, oats. Um, we've kind of tr experimented with doing spring or winter intercrop. Um, so far, the winter intercrop has done a bit better, but that means that obviously we can't control the black grass as well if we do that. So there's definitely a bit of a... It's definitely something you have to factor into what you're doing, depending on your system. I haven't uh, seen much in the way of um, negative effects, but there again, <coughs> um, for example, in, in spring onseed rape, I use mustard in my cover crops mixes sometimes, and I've used spring onseed rape quite frequently, and I've not seen much in the way of club root, as long as it's a fairly small proportion of the mix. Um, going back... A rewinding a few years when I was started going direct drilling I had a few years of real disasters with spring barley growing spring barley I used to grow wheat spring barley under conventional plant-based system wheat spring barley spring barley 
And um, so I tried that when I went. I didn't change my rotation a bit at much when I went direct drilling. But boy, oh boy, did I have rigosporium problems, bad rigosporium problems in the um, in the in the second spring barley year. So to such an extent, I I just grow wheat and then one spring barley now usually. Um, but that's sidetracking slightly. But I'm sure there are some sort of trash-borne diseases that carry over to the following year, like rigosporium. Um, that could have an effect on um, on what you put into your um, cereals in your companion cropping um, mix. Okay. I think from a, an organic point of view, we tend to use rotation in a different format as well. So that conventional guys, it's all about root-borne disease and, and take-alls and whatever. And there seems to be some evidence that the more diversity you put into your rotation, the, the lower the risk is of that anyway. Um, so whether the rotation should be driving or whether it should be the fertility inputs to part of the system, then the diversity that drives the rotation more. Okay, um, we haven't got much long time left, and I'd like to thank the um, three speakers for their coming to do this talk, um, for the efforts they've made to do it, and for, for actually being willing to be guinea pigs and try stuff and then talk about what's gone right and what's gone wrong, because that's one of the massively important aspects that we need in farming is uh, conversations amongst ourselves. So I'd like to thank you and like you to thank them for their time. Thank you.